Hello, uh, my name is James Eglinton and I am the Meldrum Senior Lecturer in Reformed Theology at the University of Edinburgh in Edinburgh, Scotland. And I'm really pleased to be here today to talk with my friend Matthew Barrett. Uh, Matthew is Professor of Theology at Midwestern Baptist Seminary. Um, and he is the author of this fascinating new book, Simply Trinity. I've been really privileged to receive uh, an advanced copy of this and to work my way through it and thoroughly enjoyed reading it so far. Uh, so we're hoping to have a conversation today about one of the chapters on the book, the, the book's second chapter, uh, which is entitled, Can We Trust the God of Our Fathers? Retrieving Biblical Orthodoxy. Um, so in the first place, it's great to have this chance to talk with you. I think this is such a timely and important book. Mm. Um, it, it addresses such key issues in thinking through who God is um, that are so consequential as well for us in thinking through even what the gospel is or uh, mm. what it means to, to be able to worship God. Mm. Um, so it's a really timely book. Um, and it's also, it's been really fun to read as well. Um, it's written so clearly and I think that's very admirable in dealing with quite you yeah. know, complex technical things, right? Yeah. Um, but also, I guess I'm a child of the 80s like you <laughs> and um, there's, a, there's a refrain going through the book that we're yeah. really traveling back in time and trying to find some important stuff from the past and then the, the refrain throughout is back to the to the DeLorean. Yeah. Um, so Back to the Future was one of my favorite um, films growing up as well. It had a huge oh, impact yeah. on on my life and giving me some kind of way of thinking about the past. So that, that's been a real treat to discover as well. Um, I don't know if you feel as disappointed as I am that it's 2021 and we still don't have hoverboards. Um, <laughs> I don't know what all no. those engineers are, are playing at, but we still don't have those. But anyway. I, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I, that disappointment, every once in a while, it just comes up in my mind. Yeah. I just think, why do we, how, how can it be 2021? Yeah. We, we still live in a universe yeah. that, you know, Doesn't we haven't have reached that, that height. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's been a really enjoyable part of the book as well. And I, I really admire um, just how engagingly you, you get your reader to think about history and its significance and, mm. um, and knowing where we've been in the past in order to make more sense of where we are today. So one of the, the really provocative claims at the heart of your book is what you call Trinity Drift. Mm. And this is the idea that, that there's something really important that should be like an anchor to us right, to keep yeah. us from drifting. But something has happened mm. and the image is obviously to me anyway it's like the image of a ship at sea and this ship was supposed to stay in one place um, but it hasn't and it's drifted away uh, carried away by currents um, but the drift is to do with the trinity and i think that that's a really helpful term to to come up with the trinity drift which is you're arguing that the church um, evangelicalism in particular has drifted very far from its orthodoxy yeah. on an essential aspect of the Christian faith, uh, which is the Trinity. And then within that, uh, you know, you, the way that you present it is that it's neglected anyway by evangelicals. And mm -hmm. I, I thought it was really striking at the beginning when you asked, you know, what, what kind of words come to us when we say, well, what is an evangelical? And we yeah. have, you know, conversion, biblicism and so on. But Trinitarian, would we all say that about evangelicals? <laughs> that, that's what we're really struck by, that they believe yeah. in, um, in one God who is uh, eternally Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not, that wouldn't be as, as strong an emphasis. So it's neglected, yeah. uh, probably quite poorly understood amongst a lot of evangelicals. But what's very provocative about your book is that you then zoom in on a very specific doctrine, a part, a part of how we understand the Trinity, that isn't just neglected or misunderstood or something like that. It's actually denied yeah. in a strong current of evangelicalism. Uh, and that idea is the eternal generation of the Son. Mm -hmm. So how we understand what makes the Son the Son within the Trinity and um, how he relates to the Father. Um, and yeah. you're arguing in this book that that we haven't just drifted from it passively, but within evangelicalism, we actually articulate an alternative that mm -hmm. that your book is arguing is is something that is denied by the very heart of of the Nicene Creed, which we're going to get into a little bit later yeah. on. Yeah, I mean that's a very powerful claim in the first place. Yeah, to say yeah, about it, evangelicalism. It is, and you know I make that claim uh, both experientially um talking and, and this is you know I'd, I'd 
we're, we're talking to each other on you know different sides of the pond, so to speak. But um, I wouldn't be surprised if if maybe some of our experiences overlap. But I, I make that claim that claim um, experientially, just in terms of uh, looking at the evangelical upbringing uh, I had and observed around me. Both it, some of it was in church and and just different types of churches. Uh, other times it was in different types of institutions. But then also even just you know academically um, as a you know uh, a, from a scholarly angle, uh, mm. the abundance of evangelical works in the past three decades, many of which have uh, just denied or maybe they were suspicious. You think of works that were suspicious, but some just outright denied core uh, facets, core pillars of um, what we would call, what, what I would call a biblical, but also a classical um, doctrine of God, and specifically in terms of the Trinity, uh, a Nicene doctrine of God. And, uh, you know, we could think, for example, of, of something like divine simplicity, which has fallen on, on really hard times. Mm -hmm. uh, there, a number of major evangelical treatments of the doctrine of God just have no patience for it. But then also, as we, we turn into uh, Trinitarian discussions, the doctrine of eternal generation. Hmm. And it, it really uh, has exploded in the last, you know, five years where, where this has been brought to the surface. Major systematic theologies, uh, either not mentioning it or neglecting it, so it doesn't really play a significant role in their formulation of the Trinity, and some just outright denying it. And... Um, yeah, you're, I, I think that um, even, even recently, as we look at some of the slow movement to reaffirm it, the reasons why it's reaffirmed are not always the same reasons uh, that the patristics affirmed it. Um, there's, there's a, at least in, in the U.S., I think there's a pretty steady um, streak of what I would call a narrow biblicism, so that, well, if someone is kind of reluctantly affirming it now, it's, it's more because of, well, they're convinced by a word study, um, rather than understanding the doctrine holistically as the fathers did in terms of the whole canon, uh, reading the whole canon Christologically, and um, understanding it as really embedded in the very DNA of the revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, um, yeah, all that to say, I use that, um, and, and we can talk more about, um, I, I think it's even, I, I, one of the, the provocative claims I make in the book is that it's even worse than this, because uh, the drift that we're talking about isn't just dealing with, say, a neglect or denial of a particular doctrine like eternal generation. It's actually, it's, I, to, to, maybe this is a bit harsh, but it's, it's more like a, a type of virus, uh, given our own times it's almost like a type of virus which is in the bloodstream mm -hmm. and uh, i go on to argue that actually uh, it's not just a denial of a particular doctrine it's a completely redefinition of the trinity and sometimes in pretty strong social categories that would have been uh, to many of you know the fathers would have been very foreign and and strange uh, especially the way that some of those social cat a, a social trinity might actually undermine uh, a nice understanding of the trinity so yeah trinity drift i think you, i'm glad you caught on to that um not just the back to the, the future reference but also yeah. the the boat on the sea uh because i and again i i don't know that we're always sometimes this is it is intentional um but other times it's unintentional i, I use the example of you know a, a couple out on their their sail, sailboat having a you know a lovely mm -hmm. uh, uh, ocean picnic or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe it's a lake, and um, you're just going about uh, your relationship and and you don't realize it, but you know an hour goes by, two hours go by, and you look up and you realize, well, we've drifted. Uh, you may not even know where you are. So that that image I think is is appropriate. Um, whether it's unintentional or intentional at times, um, I think that evangelicalism in particular has drifted some, sometimes a lot, and we're not 
always very self-aware that this is happening. Hmm. Fascinating. Yeah, th there's there are certainly interesting um, comparisons that you could make with the UK evangelicalism as well. I guess American evangelicalism is just so much larger in terms of you know the breadth of everything that fits under that umbrella term. Um, but the kind of drift that you identify so is really interesting. Um, if you were to go to is there such a thing as a generic U.S. evangelical church? I don't know, but you know, strip mall evangelicalism, right? You're, yeah. yeah. You're in some town in America on a Sunday morning, and you rock up at this evangelical church that you find, yeah. you know, next to Walmart. Um, what would be the? Is is there an identifiable alternative doctrine that you'd be likely to hear, for example, instead of the eternal generation of the sun? Yeah. Well, I think in general. Um, in general, you're not going to walk into a lot of evangelical churches and hear anything about the Trinity. Mm -hmm. um, that might sound a bit uh, harsh, but I, in, mm -hmm. in my experience, uh, it's it, that is just the case. And uh, mm -hmm. I've I've you know <laughs> witnessed a number of different types of denominations almost across the board. It, it's unlikely now. If the church is, is solidly committed to evangelical uh, principles, you hopefully will hear um, echoes of it come out. Maybe it's in a song, a hymn, perhaps, uh, if it, maybe it's a more traditional church. Um, it could come out just more subtly in a sermon. But I think, you know, what you mentioned earlier, I think, I think you're right. It, um, it doesn't, the, the doctrine of the Trinity in in the contemporary evangelical church, uh, it doesn't have a strong presence. And when we think of like marks of an evangelical, the Trinity is, is just not one of them, mm. which is telling, I think. Now, hopefully, best case scenario, it's assumed. Uh, it's assumed, but in, you know, with one generation being passed to the next generation, that assumption doesn't always follow. And I think one of the, the dangers of this is that when the Trinity is articulated, when that, whenever that, that opportunity finally comes, a lot of times, sometimes well-meaning individuals, they assume, well, I'm going to articulate the Trinity, um, these persons, in a similar way I would describe human persons and maybe even a human society and without realizing it the, the drift starts to, to reveal itself uh, mm -hmm. because all of a sudden there's 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 not really a concept of mm -hmm. um, a Trinitarian simplicity in, in essence um, we we don't really understand what it is exactly that distinguishes father son and spirit instead uh, and, and certainly, I think it would be extremely rare to hear anything about, you know, we can talk about this later, but uh, Nicene, uh, the pro-Nicene tradition is distinctions. Um, an unbegotten father, an eternally begotten son, um, an eternally spirated spirit, this would just be completely foreign. You get a, a bunch of just blank stares at that point. And um, it might sound overly academic. It would, it would just, people would have no idea what these concepts even mean. And they, the next step would be, they would, they would think, well, this certainly has nothing to do with the scriptures. Um, and uh, the danger here then becomes when, say, a pastor, maybe it's a youth pastor, maybe it's a, a lead pastor, um, maybe it's a, a, a retreat, whatever the, the situation, the danger becomes we, we then just start to presuppose uh, all kinds of 20th, 21st century categories of human persons and human societies and just assume, oh, that's, that's what makes the Trinity a Trinity. It's just this cooperation between persons, individuals, maybe they have their own wills and they're getting along with each other. But we may, and we might even go so far some evangelicals might even go so far as say they, they can even work apart from each other, independent of each other. And so all these type of assumptions start to seep in and we don't realize it, but we're actually drifting further and further away. Hmm. I mean, I think in, in your context, in, 
what does this what does this look like? I mean, I've been describing my context, sure. but yeah, I think in so my context is quite unusual within the UK even, and that I grew up in a reformed denomination, the Free Church of Scotland, it's a Presbyterian church. Um, what I was uh, in my formative years, my denomination practiced exclusive a cappella psalm singing. Okay. So we didn't sing hymns. Um, and we didn't use musical instruments other than the human voice. And that's something that we can come back to maybe later in the conversation, yeah. actually, because yeah. I'd love to talk more about worship, because that's mm. a key feature of the chapter we're talking yes. about. Um, but because we didn't sing hymns and we only sung the Psalms, um, in my denomination, we didn't, uh, you know, we didn't sing explicitly about Jesus by name other than you uh -huh. know, the messianic psalms and the way that they point forward uh, and you know we we didn't sing holy 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 god in three persons blessed trinity just because we didn't sing things other than the psalms in our church services um, but but it's a reformed denomination it's now moved to practice inclusive psalmody so we do sing yeah. holy 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 now okay my congregation but okay. when i was growing up it was only psalmody which was fantastic in in many many ways it was a huge blessing and that you grew up knowing the psalms because yeah. you sung them every Sunday at church. Yeah. Um, but we didn't have um, the register of songs that we sing as something to teach us the doctrine of the Trinity or just even to make the word more normal Trinity okay. in the first place. It's part of our church's um, confessional standards, you know, so every pastor, every elder, every deacon, you know, signs up to um, yeah. the church creeds. Um, so it's not an anti-Trinitarian denomination, yeah. um, but at the same time, it's part of the, the UK evangelical scene, which is quite influenced by the sort of biblicism mm. that this chapter also pushes back out of it. Yeah. Yeah. In, um, in, yeah, it's a, it's a very complex thing to explain, I guess, but um, maybe in having a, a, a bit of an aversion to things that seem to be man-made or traditional yes right and right. um, so certainly not i didn't grow up in an anti-trinitarian church i grew up in a trinitarian yeah. denomination yeah. but at the same time there's something about evangelical bibli biblicism yeah that that can be a bit stifling for a very important set of doctrines like what we believe about god as father yeah. son and holy spirit so i i think that the the kind of um, interaction that you would have with the, with the doctrine of the Trinity growing up in an evangelical church in the UK, in most yeah. cases, even in my kind of denomination, which is confessionally reformed and is pro-Trinitarian and yeah. um, all of its official doctrines and everything. But um, the interaction that you would have with it would probably be a children's talk at some point in your childhood mm. where someone thinks, oh, you know, these kids need to know what well, we tell them about Jesus and we tell them about yeah. God as their father and we tell them about the Holy Spirit. So we should give them something to tell them how this fits together. So right. um, did you know, kids, that yeah. water can be an ice cube yeah. and it can be vapor and it can be liquid? Therefore, yeah. God is the Trinity. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's, I mean, formally a heresy, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so most evangelical kids in the uk will have heard some kind of heretical children's talk mm. that's very well intentioned but actually yeah. it's not what we mean when we talk about one god and three persons yeah. so you've you can kind of tick that box off right you've you've been yeah. inoculated against the trinitarian heresies I... although you've actually received a bit of heresy as well yeah. um, and then from then on i think it's just it's it's what you wrote is very recognizable it's a neglected yeah. doctrine it's not something that's really at the forefront of our of our minds um and i think in the, the broader uk evangelicalism rather than the the more obviously reformed corner that i grew up in i think that would be the same as well and i think actually because of the kind of biblicism especially that dominates a lot of uk evangelical preaching where you really you know the goal of the sermon is to explain the text um, and you don't preach any kind of systematic theology. Yeah. Because, you know, a lot of UK evangelicals are very skeptical of systematic yeah. theology. Yep. Um, so if you're bound by what's in the text and you're a bit uncomfortable with, you know, yeah. even preaching expository sermons from the text, but also with the insights of systematic theology, um, you're probably not going to preach that many sermons where you're highlighting explicitly that God is triune mm -hmm. and where you need to uh, explain the workings of the Trinity as best we understand them. So I think from UK evangelicals as well, uh, that's obviously a pretty broad group, mm. but what you've written in the book is very recognizable. Yeah. You know, I'm so glad that you brought that up. That was exactly what was going through my head. It, 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 this 
commitment, a very good commitment to preaching, to expository preaching, uh, even to sometimes going verse by verse. Uh, I want to say amen to that. But at the same time, if if that if if you stop there and never actually uh, make an opportunity, um, either with that particular passage or just with the congregation as a whole, to say, okay, at some point we can't just look at a particular verse, but we have to look at the Bible as a whole, and we have to make that that step, that step mm -hmm. from really ultimately to to theological formulation. I think that that, is, like you said, is extremely foreign. Some a lot of it's due to that type of uh, of biblicism, biblicism. I think you see it in the states, and um, it might be said, "Oh, that's speculative." You know, that's uh, that's man made. Um, the trouble is, uh, what ends up happening is you have you know good intention churchgoers who say, "Well, if I'm going to come up with my doctrine of Trinity, I gotta I gotta find the verse," <laughs> and or, or preach on the verse, and uh, they'll, they'll be very, they'll either end up in heresy, like you talked about, even with kids, right, or they'll end up very frustrated trying to force something that doesn't work, because they don't realize, actually, the Trinity isn't, God doesn't reveal himself in that way, it's, it's far more organic, far more holistic than, yeah. you know, finding that magic silver bullet proof text, um, yeah. but you, you brought up, um, I, I really appreciate you share, sharing that that context. Um, I think it does overlap with the states in, in so many ways. You brought up though, in something you said earlier, worship, and and I would like to turn in that direction because I now you have me really curious um, here about even your own context. Um, when we talk about the Trinity, worship is not usually brought up in the same sentence, hmm. and uh, today. When even in uh, these debates, important debates over the doctrine of the Trinity, I think that uh, the church looks at them and says, well, that's something academic. That doesn't really have to do with minis real ministry, right? Um, and and I, I think that that type of dichotomy would have been um, just mind boggling to say the, the fourth century fathers who, yes, on the one hand, they are putting their lives on the line uh, to defend, say, um, what, what they consider a biblical and orthodox understanding of the, the Trinity. Uh, everything from divine simplicity to eternal generation to the, the, the spirit proceeding, on and on and on. But at the same time, they understand the stakes are so high, not just in terms of orthodoxy, but also in terms of our worship. It's, it's, it's always so fascinating to me, you know, is I put on sort of my historian hat to discover that um, even during the fourth century, you have hymns, what we would call hymns, hymns being written on both sides. So the Arians, yeah. and then also the, the pro-Nicene tradition. I think that they, they understood if if Arius and the Arians, or even the semi-Arians, if they are correct, this affects our worship. It affects our salvation, certainly, but it but it also affects whether we can worship the Son as begotten from the Father's essence from all eternity. If that's not the case, then then worship changes completely. Um, but I, you know, I could say more just in terms of you know evangelical that evangelical di dichotomy, but I would love to hear, you know, some of your own experience. Um, how, how, how is there this disconnect between worship and, and Trinity? I think that there is, and certainly on this side of the Atlantic. Um, so a moment ago, I spoke about the kind of context that you might encounter the doctrine of the Trinity. And if you grew up in an evangelical church um, in this you know, three leaf clover, children's talk yeah. or something like that. Um, but I think if you were, so if you were to try and find church services where you would hear the Trinity spoken of explicitly, you'd be much more, much, much more likely to encounter it either if you went to a Roman Catholic church mm. or if you went to a, a kind of liberal Protestant church or a, or a non-evangelical Protestant church that's very high on the ecclesiastical um, spectrum so if you have high liturgy for example 
um, which a lot of theologically non-evangelical churches in the UK have. Um, the Trinity and the language of the Trinity is embedded in the liturgy, and the liturgy, you know, predates uh, maybe the theology that's preached in the pulpit, but the liturgy yeah. is still there and is right. still explicitly Trinitarian. Um, and so I think one of my overriding impressions of what evangelicalism was all about growing up was evangelicalism is all about authenticity, sincerity, spontaneity, mm. desire in worship, yeah. in church worship, right? In singing and having lots of instruments and yeah. really meaning it in your heart. Yeah. Um, I remember when I was an undergraduate student, um, I went to the, the Christian Union, it's a kind of standard UK campus ministry when I was in first year. And one of the students that night was giving a talk on what worship is. And um, th there was, uh, and, and so the student had a PowerPoint presentation with yeah. the key working definition being, and I still remember it, it's etched in my memory because it, I think it's so inadequate, although I see the, you know, the sincerity in it, but worship is when you sing to Jesus and you just really feel it in your heart. Ah, yeah. I quoted word for word with the just and the really, which yeah. are also hallmarks of how evangelicals speak in the UK. Yeah. Um, that, that's, that's what worship is. It's mm. that you're really sincere and authentic in your praise and worship um, and you feel it in your heart and um, it doesn't have much that's explicitly you know, reflective of the Trinity, for example, but I was aware, for example, spending my teenage years in this church that had worship every Sunday and where we sung from our hearts sincerely uh, from the book of Psalms, that my mainstream evangelical friends looked in on us and I would hear them explicitly say, your church doesn't have praise and worship. Oh. You know, you, you don't have a drum kit, you don't have guitars, um, <laughs> you don't have worship, and we no do. Smoke we're evangelicals. Machine, huh? <laughs> yeah, and then, but then the same kind of mainstream evangelical view towards, for example, you know, non evangelical Protestants with their high liturgy yeah. is you don't really have worship either, because, yeah. you know, it's not spontaneous like ours. And, right. and, you know, the Roman Catholics don't really have worship either because it's all, you know, it's dead liturgy. Mm -hmm. um, so even though those other camps have explicitly Trinitarian parts of their liturgy. Yeah. Um, the evangelicals really pride themselves on that, you know, them being, they are the worshiping community. Mm. Um, and yet the weird thing is then, as I was really drawn to this and struck by it when I read your chapter, um, that the community that prides itself as being all about worship and we are the ones who know how to do yeah. it, yeah. Um, are actually the weakest on theologically the, the reasons for worship. Uh. Um, so I was very struck by the connection that you made between um, well, the eternal generation of the sun mm -hmm. uh, as uh, something that, you know, you're saying, and I think correctly is, is so essential to the doctrine of the Trinity, to Jesus being God, but also Jesus being worthy of our worship. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, you know, the, as you said already, if you look at the historical circumstances around you know, the, the development of the doctrine of the Trinity, establishing what is orthodoxy, what's the right thing that Christians yeah. should believe. So much of it is actually about praise and worship and about yeah, who, who worships properly. And it comes down to if Jesus is anything less than um, the eternally begotten son of God yeah. and you worship him, you sing to him with, with, you know, with really just really meaning it in your heart, you're an idolater because mm. you're worshiping a creature rather than the creator. And that argument around worship seems to have been so decisive actually in the in one side winning it in Nicaea and in Christians realizing whoa you know we do really love Jesus and yeah. you know he's the center of our worlds and we want to sing praises to him and existentially our our life of faith feels misaligned if we can't worship Jesus yeah um but we shouldn't worship Jesus if he is not the eternally begotten son of God mm. And then the link that you bring out so clearly between this you know, rejected idea of eternal generation by a lot of evangelicals and the reasons for why we should and can worship Jesus is, is really striking. Yeah, yeah. So I, when I read it, I thought evangelicalism is such a paradox, actually. It is. It really is. Uh, goodness, Jay, I mean, I, I resonate so much with what you just said in terms of, um, you know, my own evangelical experience. And I, I think you're right. I, I, and I think what you said is really profound. There is this uh, tendency really to, to say, well, I'm going to focus on my feeling, mm -hmm. um, my experience of worship, 
maybe at best, um, I'm going to focus on what God has done, but then it's usually what God has done for me. Now, you know, that's not, um, you know, that's not necessarily illegitimate. We, scripture obviously does say a lot about what God has done for you, but at the same time, if, if, if we just kind of have tunnel vision and, and only focus on that, uh, we, without realizing as evangelicals, we actually become little Schleiermachers or Protestant liberals, you know, to, to just you know, use a sweeping category in which, you know, my religious uh, experience, my, my feeling of absolute dependence, that becomes really the primary governing principle and not just in worship, but also in theology. Um, what is so ironic about all of this, and this is, you know, maybe other traditions have other, you know, dangers, but I think for the evangelical tradition, the danger is that we so focus on ourselves that we actually forget the object of our worship. Uh, so we love to talk about Jesus, um, but at the same time, who is this Jesus? Because if he's not the eternally begotten son from the father, um, then actually our worship is is idolatry, like you said. Mm. So yeah, that I, I couldn't resonate with you more. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's. Well, I'm really grateful for your chapter and making me think about that much more pointedly. Um, I guess time is ticking on, and there's so many things that we could discuss. Yeah. One thing that, um, one thing that I appreciate about how you take us into the Delorean is yeah. that you bring us back to a point in the past where we realize we need some new vocabulary. Mm. Um, if you, you know, read old texts, you realize that, um, you know, that people in particular places use particular words with yeah. a very strong sense of meaning. Um, and we're surrounded then as we step out of the DeLorean in the fourth yeah. century around Nicaea yeah. with new vocabulary, which I'm guessing will be a, new to a lot of the, the, the target audience for this book as well. Yeah. I mean, could you yeah. just briefly give us some of these key terms? Yeah, yeah, I'll try to be brief. Um... You know, for for viewers, uh, chapter two, which really goes into to detail, not so much detail that you just get overwhelmed and lost in it, uh, which is easy to do, but just enough to give you um, some of the, the key vocabulary that we're talking about that, as as we just said, is so foreign today, but was absolutely essential for, for centuries. You know, I've, when we go back to, when we get in the DeLorean, right, and we go back and we step out, uh, we find ourselves just in a very different world. Um, early on, in, in when we look at the, the turn of the, four, the third to the fourth centuries, uh, early on, we have the rise of Arianism. And this really turns the church's attention, not just to who Jesus is, but, but how, how do we actually articulate a doctrine of the Trinity that is faithful? And uh, one of the, I mean, I'm, I'm not, of course, the, the first one to point this out. Many fantastic historians before me have, but one of the essential divides is the difference between what we would call the, the pro-Nicene tradition that followed, and then the Arian or, or many breakoffs of, of Arianism was this difference between a, a unity of being and a unity of, of merely will or wills. And what, what, what does that mean? Well, if we were to, you know, get out of the DeLorean and ask, you know, go walk into an Arian church and say, well, what is it exactly that unites um, Jesus and the Father, or, or just the Trinity as a whole, they, if, if they've been pay, paying attention to, you know, some of the debates, they would have been very quick to say, well, it's, it's not a unity of essence, it's not a unity of being, as if the Son is begotten from the Father's essence, that would, that would be extremely problematic to them. Instead, they would say, no, it's merely a unity of will or wills. And that then becomes really the dividing line. There's other, there's of course many other things, but that becomes one of the major dividing lines so that whether it's Athanasius or the Cappadocians and many others, 
they then understand that, well, it's not just that the Arians are denying that the Son is eternally begotten from the Father, but uh, we have completely different understandings of what constitutes unity in the Trinity. Mm -hmm. And from this point forward, you have a development. It doesn't happen all at once. It is, it is a bit of an evolution, but a development in which the, the fathers begin to uh, articulate this doctrine of eternal generation and argue that not only is it the case that the son being begotten from his father, not only is it the case that that alone distinguishes him as son. I mean, it's almost something, it sounds complicated, I know, but it's almost something too simple, sim, simple to say. What does it mean then to be son? What does it mean for father to be father? Well, it means that he's begotten. Otherwise, he's not son, and otherwise, he's not father. And so they would argue that, well, there never, there never was a time, contrary to the Arians, there never was a time when the son was, was uh, not begotten from his father. And uh, from that point, point forward, not only do we have this language come out very strongly in the Nicene Creed, but they recognize, well, this is this, this doctrine of eternal generation, and likewise, later with uh, eternal spiration of the Spirit, this is not only what distinguishes the Son as Son, but uh, this also safeguards and protects the Son's equality with the Father. And that was something that those, the Arians and, and others could not, just could not agree to, could not say. As time goes on, uh, thankfully, you know, because of, you know, the Cappadocians, you think of, you know, the two Gregories or Basil, and though there are others, they also, uh, you know, put on their theologian cap and get very, um, get their hands dirty, so to speak, and, and really start to wrestle with vocabulary to say, how can we make sure um, everyone's quoting scripture, right? I mean, both sides are quoting scripture. So it's, it's not as if you, you, you know, just appealing to the scriptures is, is sufficient. They have, they, they have to come up with a type of vocabulary that actually protects the Trinity of the scriptures, if we can put it that way. And so they, they start making important distinctions in the, the decades that follow Nicaea, uh, distinguishing between uh, what we would call hypostasis and usia, uh, and, and distinguishing in, you know, in our English language what we would call the difference between person and essence. And, and then also uh, along those same lines, arguing that um, well, the whole pro-tradition that follows, arguing that, well, there's, there's vocabulary we can use to refer to these distinctions between the persons. And so they would use a phrase like eternal relations of origin. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we just stop and think about that, um, it makes a lot of sense. So what, what is the son's uh, relation? And by that, we don't mean, you know, in the 20th, 21st century you know, our context relationships, mm. they mean it in terms of what is this, how, how is the son originate from the father, though from all eternity. And so they will say eternal generation alone distinguishes the son and likewise will turn to the spirit and say, what is it that distinguishes the spirit? Well, it's that the spirit proceeds. Um, so procession, the spirit proceeds from the father and the son. This type of language, they uh, very helpfully summed up and said, well, what distinguishes the person's eternal relations of origin? Uh, if we move on uh, into, uh, you know, not just the patristic, but the medieval period, and of course, later others, um, you know, you, of course, are a Bavink uh, expert, others are going to, you know, build on this whole foundation they're going to use other language as well to say, how do we make sure, for example, that we don't ins insert a, a, a subordination or a hierarchy in the Trinity? Well, they're gonna respond and say that the one undivided, simple divine essence, well, this essence has three modes of subsistence. Um, and, and here they're gonna talk about the same categories, paternity, affiliation, inspiration. So I could go on and on.
the point is, though, they were very careful to choose this vocabulary, um, not because they're, you know, as, as sometimes evangelicals think today, because this is, you know, super speculative. Um, yes, it is a bit uh, abstract, and it does, this is the, the mystery of the Trinity. So this is going to take a little bit of work to wrap our minds around. But they chose this language intentionally because in their exegesis of the scriptures, they realized this actually protects uh, both the distinction and the unity of the persons to ensure uh, their divine equality and to, to fight off really and to avoid uh, inserting any type of of hierarchy um, into the imminent life of God. So that's a bit of a, I mean, obviously there's there's so much more that, that could be said, but that's a bit of a, an overview. <laughs> yeah. I think vocabulary really matters, mm. especially on things that matter. Uh, and I could give an example um, analogously from, from everyday life. A few years ago, before I came to work in Edinburgh, I was working in the Netherlands and lived there for a few years. And in my time there, I found out that I had a fairly serious um, health condition. Mm. And um, you know, my interaction with doctors was entirely in Dutch and in the Dutch health system. And I, I, you know, I needed to learn the vocabulary for this condition and for you know treatment and just trying to so that I could talk in some kind of precise way with doctors yeah. and we each knew what we were talking yeah. about about something that really matters so I learned all of that vocabulary in Dutch and was just used to that vocabulary in one language then I moved back to Edinburgh and then in my first appointment with my doctor here trying to talk about the same condition when I just didn't know the vocabulary in English yeah. it was very difficult I mean I was trying to come up with well, ways to describe what I what I meant when I just didn't have the right word, yeah. and you realize I realized after one meeting this won't work. This is too important yeah. to risk getting it all wrong by not knowing the specific terms oh. that exist to say things precisely, right? You know, you you just can't gamble with your health like that. Yeah, so the doctor yeah. completely misunderstands you, and you misunderstand the doctor. That's right. Um, so I think that there's something there that's analogous to the vocabulary in the Trinity, and that you. Yeah guide us through in this chapter. Um, every year in Edinburgh, I teach a f an introductory course for first and second year undergraduate mm. students on Christian doctrine, and we cover a unit on the Trinity. And every year I tell them, um, don't just try and wing it in the exam by making up your own terms to describe how you think the, you know, the, the yeah. Trinity works. There yeah. is specific vocabulary that is tried and tested. It has gone yeah. through a quality control procedure through some really great theological minds and yeah. through the life of the church and that's been challenged in very rigorous ways yeah and that vocabulary all exists because it allows you to understand with precision yeah. who these three persons are yeah. what you mean when you say that you worship jesus what you yeah. mean when you say that god is your father what you mm. mean when you talk about the holy spirit and those terms all give you very specific things to say and yeah. if you think you can just wing it and make up terms <laughs> as you go along it's like me with that doctor uh, um, i just can't get it right and the stakes when you're talking about something the, high. the trinity the stakes are really high yeah um like i think you began this chapter with a really great quote from augustine mm. that that the doctrine of the trinity uh, so with with it with the trinity nowhere is erring more dangerous seeking more toilsome yeah. and finding more fruitful so there's a lot to be gained by getting this right yeah absolutely no fruitful um there's a lot of effort that has to go into seeking the truth about the triune god it's not mm. easy you know trying to get your head around no. substance essence person um generation, um, spiration, it's work, it's, it takes yeah. real effort. Um, yeah. But if you get it wrong, it's dangerous, it's very dangerous, because we have got yeah. mis we have understood God wrongly. Yeah. And the things that we will say about him, will not be the truth about the God who himself is, yeah. uh, is the truth. Um, so I think yeah. the vocabulary really matters. And I'm really grateful that there's a book out now that um, that highlights yeah. that for this generation. Yeah, yeah and, and, you <laughs> Here, here I was thinking I was the only one who, James, who had that, has that type of experience with students, <laughs> in which uh, it always, it never ceases to amaze me. Um, they'll, no matter how much I warn them, they'll come and just yeah. say, I'm just going to use my own vocabulary. And 
So then you get a paper that says yeah. the Holy Spirit is a part of God. Yes. And then I'll ask the student, so when you say that the Holy Spirit is a part of God, are yeah. you saying that God is made up of different parts? Yeah. Like, is the Holy Spirit, you know, 33.333% Yeah, yeah. What percent percentage are we talking about? <laughs> and then they realize, oh, no, that's that's not what I mean. Well, then yeah. the term that you've used is, is partialism. It's a heresy. It's not Trinitarianism. Yeah. Um, so the, the more students try and come up with their own vocabulary, which usually yeah. they do when they're panicking in an exam, yes. um, the worse it gets and they just tie themselves up and not saying <laughs> things that they don't really mean. Oh, um, So well, the, the technical vocabulary is there to help you. Yeah, it is. It is. And uh, I, I don't think I could put it better than that. It When it, to our viewers, you know, is as you are thinking about the Nicene Creed, as well as just the the the, the pro nicene tradition as a whole it is there to help you <laughs> like i don't think i could say that enough like it is your friend you are standing on these very sturdy shoulders uh they have labored so hard to test this vocabulary to get it right to to make sure it's mm -hmm. faithful to the to the concepts we're seeing in the scriptures and that it simultaneously guards you from a whole litany of uh, of heresies, you know, James. While we're on the topic, you know, uh, uh, it raises the question of well, how, you know, when we when we read the something like the Nicene Creed, how do we do that? You know, we, okay, maybe maybe we've convinced. Hopefully, you know, we've convinced um, our, our viewers that it's there to help you in so many ways. Okay, the next step, I suppose, would be well, how how exactly do I read it? How do I interpret it? You know, let me just throw throw something at you here. I'd love to hear how you how you would respond to this. Um, on the one hand, when we approach the creed, we discover that um, we we have to know we have to know how to read it, right? We have we have to know exactly how to read it in a way that not only is faithful but also gives us the chance to make these type of distinctions in a way that will help us understand the scriptures. Now, that task is very different, I think, from what how we see the, the creed being approached and used, say, in in the modern era. Can you can you flesh out like what what is some of that difference between how moderns approached something like the Nicene Creed and, and then what you're advocating, how we read yeah. it? Yeah, indeed. I suppose the text that comes to mind first for me is Friedrich Schleiermacher, yeah. the, fa the father of yeah. modern theology, modern liberal Protestant theology, and you mentioned him earlier. In his book, The Christian Faith, he uh, has a section on the creed, um, particularly looking at Christology and looking, um, looking at what it means for Jesus to have, um, or looking at the creeds in terms of, you know, Jesus to have two natures in one person and so on. And when he approaches those kinds of texts, um, he deconstructs them, taking them apart as though each section of the creed and each word is like a cog in a machine. Mm. And um, he really, uh, so he, there's a kind of mechanical view, I think, of the, yeah. of the creeds, right? And he takes each component of the creed then and really pushes it to see, you know, if I pummel this, this cog, mm. when will it break? And then when finally it breaks, then you say, well, the cogs don't really work. So do we even need this creed? Mm. Um, I think that that's certainly it's not how I read the creed and I don't think it's the, the right way to read it. Um, I don't think that, you know, each of these words, each of these phrases and concepts is there to be viewed as a cog in a machine like that. Um, you've already just mentioned one aspect of what these words are for. They're mm. there to give you ways to speak the truth about God so that if you didn't say that this particular word, the word you would say and said that you'd make up for yourself won't be true. So they keep you from straying into heresy. Yeah. Um, but the flip side of that is that they give you a, a correct word to say that is itself um, a response to what is ultimately a mystery. Mm. And that God is just so far above, he, he so far transcends the limits of our minds. And yet he shares his self-knowledge with us. And that's a, yeah. a wonderful and a glorious thing. Yeah. Um, and we have these words of confession, um, which are words that reflect on the mystery of godliness that 
humanity and divinity can be joined together in Christ or that that the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit are the, the three persons of the Godhead. Mm. Um, I mean, we are talking about mystery, yeah. but we need to have something to say rather than say nothing mm. because God reveals himself to us and calls us to say something in response. So revelation always calls for a response. So if we were to say nothing, we'd be neglecting God's revelation of himself. Yeah. But there are lots of other things that we could say that would be misunderstandings or yeah. um, manipulations of what God has revealed. Yeah. So the creed gives us words that are reflections of mystery. So I think it's just the wrong approach to you know remove all the components and just see you know how many times can I hit it before it crumbles. Yeah. I think you've missed the point of what the creed is for. So I think that there's a much more edifying way to read the mm. creeds. Mm. Um, and I think so one thing um, that you touched on at the end of this chapter, which really struck me as well, because it surprised me okay. was when you said that evangelicals need to think about the, the, the this yeah, tradition, this faith passed on by our fathers and the faith. We need to view that with a, a hermeneutic of trust, and not yeah. a hermeneutic of suspicion. So we shouldn't interpret it always you know, with a suspicious kind of frame of mind, right. thinking that they're right to get us and trip us up and that they mean our ill will um, and giving this to us. Um, so when I think of the, the language of hermeneutics of suspicion, I think of, um, you know, pretty secular ways of, of thinking in the first place or liberal theology. Um, but you're saying you kind of imply that, that evangelicals have a hermeneutic of suspicion and how they receive this, which I think is also the wrong way to read it. And I yeah. think the question that you pose ultimately in the chapter, can we trust the God of our fathers, is, is a really good one for, for evangelicals yeah. to face. Um, if you do trust the God of your fathers, then there's also an element of trust in your fathers as well. Yeah. In the faith that's been handed down to the saints and in, in the tradition of the church, yeah. that, that you're willing to trust it as well. You know, this, I, I do make this, I, I carved out um some space at the end of chap of this chapter chapter two on on the nicene creed for this issue because at first i just kind of ended it and i thought um this is just like we talked about evangelicals who are just been born and bred on a type of sometimes a very crude biblicism um they are going to look at something like the Nicene Creed or the Fathers, uh, number one, with the worst caricatures in mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. And number two, like, like you're mentioning, with a hermeneutic of suspicion. This is, it's, it's just so ironic, though, right? Because, I mean, think about the, the example you just gave of someone like Schleiermacher. That is... Um, that is, you know, to be critical of him, that is the type of hermeneutic he's bringing to um, not just the creed, but to um, Orthodox Trinitarianism and these categories. And you see it um, by the by the time you get finished um, with his his volume on the Christian faith, uh, he starts to dispense with uh, these uh, concepts we've talked about and he starts to entertain um everything from unitarianism um to, to a whole number of of other um uh, even heresies and you start to 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 get that impression but the irony in all of this right is that without realizing it as evangelicals we sometimes do the same thing mm. uh we come to it with a hermeneutic of suspicion. Mm -hmm. And um, that I think has really shown itself in the last several decades. Uh, you pick up an evangelical doctrine of God. Um, not all, but many of them, you see this suspicion come through hot and heavy, <laughs> if I can say it that way. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's subtle, but other times it's very heavy in its emphasis. Just this, I don't understand this. This seems irrational. This doesn't make sense. This doesn't fit this Bible. I don't have a Bible verse for it. You start to see this biblicism in which there's this mindset of, well, I just believe the Bible. But in reality, it's a little, it's, it's a lot like uh, that hermeneutic of suspicion you talked about. Over against all that, my, my 
proposal, and, and here I am just begging evangelicals to say, get in the DeLorean and, and let's exercise historical humility, right? So I, in other words, I, I'm not writing this book out of arrogance to say, you know, shame on you, or, um, you know, look how, you know, I've got an idea, you don't, you know, that's that type of mindset. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to it, looking at my own past saying, wow, um, this is a hermeneutic of trust that has just not been there in the, in the tradition I was, I've experienced. Let's change that. Let's change that. And let's come back to the creed and read it. Um, and not just the creed, but Nicene theology, with, with historical humility, humility, understanding, hey, this has been tested through time. Don't, don't be so quick to just start jettisoning core components. Maybe, just maybe, there's a both an exegetical and a theological, dare I say, dogmatic rationale and logic to this that helps, helps uh, really safeguards us from making those type of slippery, easy missteps that 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 could e easily lead us into any number of historical heresies, or on the other hand, contemporary versions of the Trinity that um, really can't can't uh, do justice to everything from divine simplicity to these eternal relations of origin. I think I would bet this. I think that if evangelicals put on a, a hermeneutic of trust rather than suspicion, their eyes will be really opened wide to the riches of the Nicene tradition. Not only will they see things in the text they didn't see before, uh, but they will start to think through uh, some of the theological reasons why, say, a doctrine like eternal generation or a doctrine like divine simplicity, not only protects the Trinity from error, but also then makes entire sense of the storyline of scripture and even the gospel itself, dare I say, even doxology. That's, that's, that's the goal anyway. That's where I want people to head. Great. Well, um, I'm very grateful to you for writing the book and um, I'm very thankful for the chance to talk and have well, for me, has been a, a really enjoyable, edifying conversation about it. So I hope the book's well received and that it challenges evangelicals to think more about the and if I can, and who is can, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah, and James, if I can just interrupt you here before we sign off with our, our viewers, I can't help myself. You know, we've been talking about, you know, my my book, uh, Simply Trinity, but uh, to, our, to our viewers, James has just written um a, a mag, a, just a, a a large critical edition um if i can call it that a, a major biography on herman bavink um you know we've been talking about the trinity of course when you read bavink's reform dogmatics goodness his doctrine of god right i mean here is one of the i think one of the best treatments of the doctrine of god in in uh church history so I would, you know, if I can can slide that uh, that commercial in a little bit for you, James. Uh, I know you wouldn't do it for Thanks. yourself, but but yeah, I mean that that biography is is so helpful. And I I would say, you know, read read James's uh, work there, and then go read Bavink himself. <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind of you. <laughs>